We need to be aware of that because discerning of spirits is critical and will become more critical in the days that are just ahead of us. As we move further into the darkness that's coming on the world and the world system becomes increasingly controlled and motivated and driven by Satan and it becomes more and more open. It's always been under his control to some extent. But we're experiencing a tremendous upsurge of demonic power. And just like before Jesus came the first time, there was a tremendous upsurge and revival of demonic power, almost as if the host of the evil one were resisting the coming and the manifestation of the Son of God. Even so, in the days before Jesus comes again, there shall be a like revival of surging supernatural power. And we are beginning, we are in that now, and it's already beginning. The tides of evil are sweeping. If you're not aware of that, you need to uh, become aware of it because it's true. And we need to be aware of this not because we would be afraid or bothered by it particularly, but simply because it's necessary for us to have our weapons in order. And discernment of spirits is one of the weapons that God has given us to warn us and to help us. Now, there are several spirits in view. There are things that are the Holy Spirit. We need to be able to tell when the Holy Spirit's working, don't we? There's a human spirit at work which is very easily motivated by the enemy. And then there's, there are angelic spirits, the spirits of God and the spirits of the evil one, the fallen angels, the demons. And we need to be able to exercise discerning of spirits to know which is which. Now, discerning of spirits is not the ability to see faults in other people. There are a lot of people who have the ability to see faults in other people, and they certainly don't have discerning of spirits. Common sense can reveal that. And then, well, of course, discerning of spirits is not a gift of suspicion either. You suspect everybody. And you have to remember that, although I'm not uh, especially fond of uh, psychiatric jargon and everything, every once in a while they have a little nugget of truth tucked away in amongst a bunch of garbage, and um, they have this thing they call projection, whereby the faults you have you project on other people in your mind. And so you think everybody else is guilty of what you are. Be careful, you'll have to give away what your pet sin is. Huh? What I'm simply saying is, when we move into this area, we've got to be careful and be led of the Holy Spirit and of the Word of God. Because discerning of spirits is not the ability to see faults in other people. That's not difficult at all. You can do that without any kind of uh, leading from the Lord. Isn't that right? Well, you husbands and wives could see faults in your mate a long time before you got saved. Right? And even afterwards? Huh? We won't say about other people. You've seen them there, too. Discerning of spirits is not mind reading. It's not spiritualistic psychiatry. It's not some kind of psychiatric nonsense. The pur there is a purpose in discerning of spirits. It is to see within the spirit world. It is a gift from God. It can be sought, by the way. But be careful what your motive is. If you just want to know what's wrong with everybody, the devil can fix that. Did you know that? Remember, for every genuine gift of the Lord, there is a counterfeit. So uh, the discerning of spirits is to see within the spirit world and to discern the evil spirits. We don't have to worry about God's angelic spirits. They're not going to hurt us. We don't have to worry about the Holy Spirit. He's going to help us. We're looking for the enemy and the discernment of evil spirits and it'll also help you to discern evil and hypocrisy moving among God's people. Buzz was just sharing with me something he had run down in the references on murmuring, grumbling, and complaining. Those root words go back to practicing wizardry. Isn't that interesting? 
Now, another purpose of discerning of spirits is because there are many times that deliverance and healing and even salvation is blocked from coming about because of the presence of evil spirits. If we're unaware of that, we're not going to be able to win them to the Lord. Long before I tangle with demons directly and head on and uh, in a massive onslaught, I learned the truth of the Scripture that says, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded their mind, that they might not see and believe that Jesus is the Christ, is what it's talking about. And I learned that you could bind... Satan and just rebuke Satan in Jesus' name and command them to let go of their minds and they would be able then to receive the Lord if they were indeed willing to trust him. Whereas before they were blocked, they were hindered. So the gift of discerning of spirits, which is mentioned in Corinthians, is extremely important and in our work it's absolutely essential. Now, the angels of God we know a little bit about in Revelation 12, 4, we find out the angels of God outnumber the angels of the devil two to one. And however many millions or billions of angels there are in Satan's army, there's twice that many in God's army. That's nice. That gives us a two-for-one majority. That's very comfortable. Also, angels commissioned of God have a great deal more power than those commissioned by Satan. Now, they don't like for you to tell this, but, I mean, the angels sent by God have a great deal more power. It only took two angels to push the stone away from the tomb when Jesus was re resurrected, and every demon, including Satan, were trying to bind that pl thing in place. And there was no way they could stop the Lord of glory from coming out. And only two angels, I was told this by a demon, and he wept and cried. He thought it was terrible that there was only two who moved that stone. And all the rest were opposing it unsuccessfully. This gives you an idea of how much chance the devil has to win. He's outgunned, he's outmanned, he's outnumbered by God on every hand. The only reason he's running through the world almost unopposed is because the Church of Jesus Christ has not picked up the message of deliverance, the message that will free the people and get them moving. And they have not picked up the message of victory. They think that just by saying victory, 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 you're going to win. You've got to get in there and fight. You've got to get in there and roll up your sleeves and get to work and attack the enemy in Jesus' name. Of course it's going to be spiritual power that turns the tide. Of course spiritual power will be the crucial thing. But God likes some elbow grease in there too. Why else would he have bothered to have Israel have an army when it marched into the land? Why have an army at all if God's going to do everything without anything? No, they had armed men and they fought. And they won by spiritual power, but they also applied physical force. They got into the battle. I'm glad, too, because, you know, it would be nice to sit back and watch everything fold, but it might get a little boring after a while. But God throws us into the battle and says, there's something you can do. Now, of course, in Hebrews 1, 7 and 1, 14, we find he makes his angels to be spirits, ministering spirits to them that are the heirs of salvation. That's us. And so we have the right to call the angels of God. In Psalm 34, 7, it talks about the angel of the Lord encampeth round about those that fear him. <laughs> That's kind of nice, too. I mean, to have the guards on, you know, the angel of the Lord encamping round about you. That means the enemy is not going to be able to take you by surprise. And then in Matthew 18.10, a beautiful reference, Just got, Jesus just kind of picks up the curtain and lets us just catch a quick glimpse. He doesn't go into details, but he talks about these little ones whose angels always behold the face of the Father. Guardian angel assigned to people, to children, and to believers. Now, in working with the enemy, we have learned that though you have guardian, at least one guardian angel, 
that you can nullify their work and prevent them from protecting you if you insist on going into habitual sin. But the guardian angels are the ones who intervene and protect you and me when we're following the Lord. We make foolish mistakes, we make stupid mistakes, and they intervene to help us. But if we deliberately and cold-bloodedly set out on a course to defy and to disregard what God has said, then they are there, but they cannot protect us from the consequences. The guardian angel. In Genesis 24, you find a, an angel around the tree of life in Eden. Aren't you glad? Had you ever thanked the Lord because he put that uh, cherubim with that flaming sword that went in all directions around that tree? If Adam and Eve had ever gotten to that tree of life and eaten of that, they'd been cursed in those bodies forever and ever. They'd never gotten out of them. There'd never been any new bodies. Did you know that? What a blessing it was that God immediately put the guard around the tree of life so they could not eat of that tree and live in those bodies forever. You know where that tree is now? Anybody know? You'll find it mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's transplanted to heaven. That'd be a good safe place, right? We can eat all we want up there, tree of life. Amen? We'll have new bodies then. We'll be in better shape to appreciate it, too. In Second Kings 2, 9, Elijah said to Elisha, If you see me when I leave, then you can have what you desire. Which Elisha said, I want a double portion of the spirit that rests on you. And so uh, these were people who were dealing with the angelic realm and the spirit realm. And in the uh, Second Kings 2.15, you'll find out that Elisha became a man of power because indeed he did persevere. God has a great deal of use for people who stick to the job, who are like a postage stamp. They get the job done by sticking to it. A lot of these people peel off early and they don't ever get through and they never see the glory that God has intended because they get tired. I'm just tired of waiting. If you get tired of waiting, well, then you're just going to flake off before God really moves and does the work. You've got to stay in the trail. In season, that's when everything is gung-ho and everybody's happy. And out of season, that's when yuck. That's when you don't feel like it and nobody else feels like it and everybody's against it. Oh, it's easy to stand up and preach when everybody's saying, Amen, preach it, brother, hallelujah, and the crowds are pouring in. I'll tell you one thing, if you get up and preach a hard doctrine like eat my flesh and drink my blood, then all the disciples, do, 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 they're gone, gone, gone. Had you ever felt sorry for those disciples that day? Here they have thousands of people. They had their Sunday school enlargement campaign. The crowds were just running out. Everybody was enthusiastic. Everybody was following Jesus. It's the greatest thing that ever was. Hallelujah! And Jesus stood up there and said, You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Come on, honey, let's get the kids and go. I don't understand that. Can you imagine the dismay of Simon Peter, who doubtless was the Sunday school superintendent, as he watched all the happy little pupils marching away? Lord, what are you doing? We were doing so well, and now everybody's going. I wonder why preachers don't read that passage more. Jesus emptied the crowd. He dumped them deliberately. The disciples looked and said, Lord, what are you doing? Preach nice things and they'll come. Look, all these wonderful things, the miracles and everything, they're just coming in. And then you turn around and everybody, nobody but us. we got to start all over. Isn't that sad? Jesus dismissed the bread and fish disciples because they wouldn't stick. You know who did stick? Eleven who didn't understand what he was doing, and they didn't like it. But they didn't have any place else to go either. So they stuck. And one devil, Judas, he stuck to try to wreck the whole operation. 
One in twelve was the devil. Don't be surprised if you run across the devil walking around in the midst. Jesus was the perfect leader, and he had one twelfth devil, demon. You think about that, it'll encourage you. So don't call me a demon. I didn't call anybody a demon. But I'm just saying, don't get discouraged if you see the enemy working, because that's the way he works. And he'll work right up to the last go-round. That's all right. He didn't stop the work, did he? Jesus made it to the cross and made it out of the tomb. And Judas lost totally. No problem. Well, in Second Kings 6.17, you find Elisha looking out the window and seeing the armies of God, yeah, the armies of heaven gathered around this house, protecting him from the enemy. Now, the Bible is full of men who were men of two worlds. In Exodus 33, verses 11 through 23, you'll find a fascinating story about Moses, who wanted to see God. He wanted to see him up close. And God finally told him, all right, you hide in the cleft or the split in the rock, and I'll put my hand over you, and then I'll cause my back part, the trail of my garment, to come past you. Because you can't look at me and live. I don't want to kill you. And he caused the back parts of his garment to come past, and he was covered. You better be covered when God comes in view. He'll kill you. Moses was a, mo a man who looked into the spirit world. He had a hunger to. Now, you know, people say today, oh, you shouldn't do that. It's amazing how many people in the Bible did. Is it dangerous? Sure, because there's two sides. Just be sure your eyes are zeroed in 2020 on the Lord. Huh? And be sure your motivation is right. Moses didn't want to see the Lord out of idle curiosity. He didn't want to see the Lord to make him have a closer walk with the Lord. He had the closest walk possibly of anybody on the earth. He just wanted to get a little bit closer, that's all. A lot of people, you know, they read that, say, Oh, good, Lord, reveal yourself to me. Why? Why should he? You haven't even used the revelation he's already given you. Many times we have squandered what revelation God has given us. We haven't even used prayer, Bible study. We haven't used any of the authority God has given us. We just want some spectacular boom, boom. So we can say, hey, guess what I got? I got a revelation. I got a vision. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you're looking for, you've got wrong motivation. You know the people that God does this with? Usually it's people who are not even looking for it. They're just looking for a close walk with him. And they're usually about as startled as anybody when it happens. If you want to be an instrument of God filled with power, then get your hands off the glory of God. God says, my glory I'll not share with another. We had a mass deliverance service in Bakersfield, which was the usual. Nice. The enemy was smashed, and that was great. But you know, every time I stand up with that mass deliverance, every time the Lord says, do the mass deliverance service, I always stand in awe, really, because what happens shouldn't happen by all logic, by all reasoning, because I deliberately low-key it, because people are always saying, you're whipping people into hysteria, you know, and that's what does it, really gets them all stirred up and scared and frightened and all this, and then they just, boom! So I deliberately back, throttle back. Make it low-key all the way, 
and I stand in amazement as I move into the final drawing of the net. The thought always crosses my mind. The devil says, you reckon it'll work this time, Worley? I said, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if the power of the Lord is still working. I feel like Elisha standing at the river. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And every time when I haul off and smite that water and start drawing that net, it's always such a blessing. I get such a blessing when the screams and the coughing began. I think, praise God, no man could do this. And I challenge anybody, just get up and read off a list and see what happens. It's amazing what the power of God will do when you give God the glory. It won't work unless you give God all the glory. Did you know that? And I always stand in awe and amazement and watch what happens. I know it's going to because God is faithful. He honors his word. And when his people are obedient and they forgive people and they renounce the occult, and when they are open to him and are willing to be cleansed, when you throw that net out, those things are going to react. They always do. And it's beautiful to see God's faithfulness. But what I'm saying is, all I would have to do to ruin that whole service is to say, okay, folks, here I am, the hotshot exorcist, let me show you how to do it. If I had that attitude in my mind, I wouldn't have to say a word. I could say the same words in the same tone of voice, and it would fall flat. It would be a dead duck. Now, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just simply saying that when you're dealing with God, you get out of the way. You depend on the Word of God, on the power of Jesus' name, on his blood, and on him coming through, and he'll do it. Look at how many unlikely people he's used in this church. I have a sermon called Unlikely People with Unlimited Possibilities. The woman at the well. Who in thunder would have ever picked her? I mean, she was the, she was the scarlet woman of the whole town. What a rotten egg she was. God would never use anybody like that. Yuck. But he did because that woman, deep in her heart, though she was deep in sin, she was desperately wanting to be free. And she had heard that Messiah would come someday. She didn't know how he could help her, but she knew she didn't have any other hope. And when she swung on to Jesus, she tore the town up. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Every time I see somebody come into the meetings or into the church who has a scarlet background of any kind, some woman who comes who's broken, whose life is smeared and messed up, I think, Lord, have mercy, help us to deal tenderly and sweetly. This could be another woman at the well. There's no telling how many she may turn to the Lord if she's handled and brought to the Savior so he can work a miracle like he did with her. She'll never do it in herself. But she turned the whole town upside down by what happened to her. Who would have picked the Gadarene demoniac? I wouldn't want him, would you? He'd have been in the nut house if they'd had one, so they didn't have one, so they just locked him out and pushed him out in the tomb. Crazy. Nuts. Who would pick him to prepare the way for the Savior? Jesus did. He cleaned him up, delivered him, and he tried to climb the boat with him. And he said, no, you go and tell your friends. In just a matter of months, Jesus came back, and that whole town, that whole area that said, please leave our coast, turned out in droves to hear him because of the testimony of that man. Every time I find somebody that's nuts, like Al Roberts, they wander in here, or like some of the rest of us, I think, thank God, we may have another one here that God is going to use to turn hundreds, thousands to the Lord. Now, it isn't automatic, remember. It's the instrument that comes and is broken before the Lord and is willing to be used. That's the one he chooses. What a beautiful thing it is if we just see things through God's eyes. And Simon Peter, who'd choose an old cussing 
fisherman who had his foot in his mouth most of the time because he was popped off all the time. He's always popping off, saying the wrong thing too quick. Who picked him? He's not even tactful. Huh? And here he is, an unlikely person, and Jesus picked him. And after he got through breaking him and refining him, oh, it took a while because he had a lot of rough edges, but he got them. And then you find him being the marvelous instrument he was in Jesus. Who'd pick Paul? Snotty, hateful, religious, Pharisee, arrogant, stuck up, smart. He was smart and he knew it. Religious, hypocrite, hatred for everything, no tolerance for anything. Who'd want him? God did. And he went to jab at him. He jabbed him first. With, he, he threw the hooks with Stephen. Oh, the devil blew it. You know, sometimes I'm going to take. I'm going to make a sermon on the devil blew it. You know, because over and over again through the Bible we have instances where the devil just—I mean—he played the fool. The worst thing he ever did was crucify Jesus. That—that that was. I mean, he played right into the Lord's hand. And. Uh, but he, he's goofed all the way through. He's made big blunders, terrible blunders. He made a blunder. He hated Stephen. And he brought Saul of Tarsus out there to watch it. And you see how evil this person is. Saul said, that's right. All us righteous people can see how awful that is, that blasphemer. He deserves to die. Here, I'll keep you closed while you kill him. He stood there consenting, yes. <laughs> what a fool the devil was. When Stephen looked up and said, I see Jesus, <clears throat> Saul of Tarsus got hit. I mean, a hook hit him, and he tried to shake that thing, you know. Doesn't bother me, bother me, bother me, bother me. That's right. Stephen's confession and his obvious, when his face lit up, he looked like an angel. Saul said, that's just like these supernatural things. Must be in the black magic or something. Hmm? But you know, that hook held. And months later, oh, months later, oh, Saul of Tarsus, God came along and said, okay, this is it, big boy. Bam! Slapped him to the ground. Some people say, I want to be converted like Saul was. I wouldn't. No compliment. I mean, he was so bad until God had knocked the daylights out of him, blinded him, before he'd, he'd come around and listen. You sure that's the way you want to be converted? He was the original hardhead. The Lord said, Saul, Saul, how come you're persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? It's hard for you to kick against that hook. <laughs> Old Stephen is still giggity. Can you imagine what happened when Saul yielded and went to Ananias? How would you like to have been Ananias? <laughs> How would you like for God to come tell you to go get the chief persecutor and lay hands on him? Boy, I bet they had an argument. I mean, the Lord and that man. Hey, Lord, that's sure death. That's one kills everybody and hauls them off to jail. Lord, you don't want me to do that, do you? Yep, go lay hands on him. And he did, and the scales fell, and he said, Brother Saul, I'll tell you, Stephen took off and had a glorified spasm all over heaven. That's right. You talk about residuals. Have you ever heard about residuals? Stephen has been drawing off of Saul and his writing all these centuries. Every time somebody gets saved, coming down that Roman road you hear about, you know? How's that for God to come tell you to go get the chief persecutor and lay hands on him? Boy, I bet they have an argument. I mean, the Lord and that man. Hey, Lord, that's sure death. That's the one kills everybody and hauls them off to jail. Lord, you don't want me to do that, do you? Yep, go lay hands on him. 
And he did, and the scales fell, and he said, Brother Saul, I'll tell you, Stephen took off and had a glorified spasm all over heaven. That's right. You talk about residuals. Have you ever heard about residuals? Stephen has been drawing off of Saul and his writing all these centuries. Every time somebody gets saved, coming down that Roman road you hear about, you know, I think, I think Paul and Stephen do a dance all over heaven. So Stephen's getting, he, he's cutting in on it too, you see. Isn't that something? I wouldn't have picked Saul, the old religious bigot, would you? But Jesus did. He's picked some unusual people to do his work. He might even pick you. Huh? He might even use me. We could keep ourselves where God wants us, right under his protection and his power. There's no limit to what he'll do. Well, in Genesis 18, 17, and then later on the passage, you'll find that Abraham was a man of two worlds. An angel came. God said, I can't do anything until I tell my friend Abraham. Said Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Whoop. Abraham said, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, Lord, I've got, uh, well, uh, I have an interest over there. <laughs> um, would you spare the city if perhaps you might find this many and that many and the other many? And the Lord said, yes, yes. Abraham was a man of two worlds. He looked into the other world. You know, it's amazing. In Joshua 5.13, Joshua was a man hung up between two worlds, too. Moses was dead. They were going to cross the river the next day. General Joshua goes and falls on his face before the Lord. And all of a sudden, there's somebody there. He jumps up, being a soldier, said, Who are you? Are you an enemy? Are you a friend? He's on guard. He said, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. I'll take charge now. That was General Jesus showing up. That's right. He came down and took command. Joshua was there laying there worrying, What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Can I do it? Moses did it. Can I do it, Lord? Oh, Lord, who am I? As he laid on his face, Jesus showed up and said, You don't have to worry about it, son. I'm leading. You're just going to follow. Praise the Lord. Joshua got a glimpse into this thing. And you know, if you read over in, um, let's see, it's over in um, Deuteronomy 34, 9, it talks about that a spirit of wisdom was in Joshua all his life because Moses laid his hands on him and gave it to him. That's interesting, isn't it? I don't think you can pass out what you don't have, however. You can impart to others what you don't have yourself, but you can pass on the good things of the Lord to those who are to work for the Lord. Thank God. Now, in Judges 6.22, you find Gideon. He's threshing grain secretly, and all of a sudden the angel appears and said, you're going to lead the hosts of God. You're going to lead the armies of God. He said, who, me? I'm not a soldier. I'm just a farm boy. The angel said, nevertheless, you're going to be God's man. Isn't that something? I wouldn't have picked him, would you? And God did. Judges 13, 6. A man named Manoah and his wife had a strange visitor who told them they were going to have a son who was going to be a Nazarite. And his name was going to be Samson. They were in contact with two worlds. Daniel 9, 21. Daniel was praying 
earnestly looking into the matter of what was going to happen to Israel in the 10th verse and uh, 10th chapter 6th and 7th verses an angel appears and boy he got a big one on the string Gabriel himself showed up and the angel Gabriel came about the time of the evening oblation about 3 in the afternoon same time Jesus was crucified same time the fire fell on Carmel same time a lot of interesting things happened in the Bible and Gabriel came and spoke to him and told him what he needed to know. In Luke 1, 11 through 22, you'll find the story of Zacharias and how he ministered before the Lord in the temple. He was going about his business as a Levite priest. He wasn't anything spe special or spectacular. And an angel appeared to him and told him he's going to have a son. He said, why, we can't have a son? We've wanted a son. But there's no possibility. He said, oh yes, you're going to have a son and his name is going to be called John because you don't believe you won't be able to say anything until he's born. Gals, how would you like to live in the house of a man who hadn't been to speak for nine, nine months? Huh? What happened? John the Baptist was born to Elizabeth and Zechariah. He was first cousin. Uh, Elizabeth and uh, Mary were first cousins. And you remember the beautiful story there. Gabriel appeared to Mary about three months later and told her the news in the first chapter of Luke that she was going to bear the child that had been promised the Messiah. You have to realize that every Jewish girl had been taught that the Savior was coming, the Messiah was coming, that one day a Jewish girl would conceive and bear that child. Now, they didn't understand all about it, but they did have the prophecy that said a virgin should conceive and give her. And every Jewish girl was taught to keep herself that she might be the vessel of the Lord. Can you imagine the excitement of Mary, who was probably 15 or 16, when the angel appeared to her and told her this? Can you imagine the awe and the wonder she felt that she had been chosen? She certainly didn't understand it. She was in contact with another world. And the, uh, in the second chapter of Luke and the ninth through the twentieth verses, you find the story of some shepherds out on a hill who came in contact with another world. And they rushed off to see the Savior. In Acts 5.20, you find... The preacher got thrown in jail. The king had killed James, the one they called James the Less, and had killed Stephen. And uh, he thought, well, we're getting along pretty well. We haven't caused a riot. Now we'll get, the, we'll get the leader. So he grabbed Peter, threw him in jail, and planned to kill him. The church didn't have much influence, so they went to prayer. Can you imagine how they prayed that night for the preacher that was in jail? Lord, let our preacher out of jail. Lord, now you know Nicodemus has high connection. Joseph of Arimathea, you know, they're, they're well placed. They have connections. Maybe you could use them, Lord, to, to get into the political leaders. And They did like we did. You know, they tried to help God figure out a way to do it. Did you ever do that? You know, you just, you just figure out how the Lord can do this. You don't want him to get in a bind so he can't do anything. I mean, after all, he might have to work a miracle if, uh, if you didn't help him figure out some reasonable, logical way to get it done, huh? I can just imagine how they were praying different ways, like you and I would pray, you know. In the natural, we'd think, well, let's see. Now, how could that be done? Well, it might be done this way or that way. And there's nothing particularly wrong with that, except it was just funny because God just bypassed all of that. And an angel of the Lord came in and, and smote Peter on the side. Interesting, because when he smote Herod on the side, <laughs> he was eaten up with worms and died. When he smote Peter on the side, the old preacher said, who? He said, get up, let's go. Peter thought, oh, what a lovely dream. <laughs> okay, no problem. The doors swung open. He thought, boy, this is the best dream I've ever had. <laughs> this is great. They walked out, and then when the cold night air hit him in the face, the angel said, okay, now you can take it from here. I'm going, hmm. Peter said, I'm really out. I'm, I'm awake. I'm not asleep. Wow. Where does he go? 
Well, where's that fanatical bunch likely to gather? Oh, yeah. They'll be over there praying. Those bangs on the go- gate, you remember? The outer courtyard? Bang, 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 bang. No tell what time it is. Little girl goes to the door. Rhoda, she looks out through the grate. <gasps> and she turns, she forgets to open the gate. And she runs back in. She's out there! She's out there! Honey, now hush, hush. You're just, you're tired. You're overtired. We're all praying for He'll be all right. We're, we're praying, honey. You just settle down now. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying? He, he's out there. He, come on. He's out there. Oh, now, honey, don't get all overwrought. You know, we've all been praying for Peter to be released. And probably tomorrow the Lord will get him out of jail, you know. We're just going to trust the Lord. Bang, 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 bang. And it dawns on him, maybe the kid's telling the truth. Oh, my, in walks Peter and tells them what happened. Isn't that something? Because of contact with the Lord. I'm calling these things to your attention and to mine because we're going to need to be in touch with the other world through the power of God. Did you know that? And we need to learn how to test and try the Spirit to see if they be of God. Now, in Acts 10, 6, Cornelius, a Gentile who had done everything religious and nice that he knew to do, was praying and an angel appeared and told him what to do. And he said, there's a man who can help you send over and get him. He's already seen what God wants him to do. Right now, I'm dealing with him. Isn't that good? God's dealing with Cornelius over here at the same time he's dealing with Peter. He's getting the witness ready. He's getting the receptacle ready. And he brings them all together. And then great and wonderful blessings come. By the way, Peter didn't stop to ask anybody about going over there. We we overlooked the fact that he was staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. Did you know that was forbidden under Jewish law? A good Jew could not stay in a tanner's house because he dealt with dead bodies. And that was verboten. Peter was staying over there. And when that vision came and Peter was told what to do, he didn't say, well, Lord, I'll tell you what, I'll send a runner over to Jerusalem and ask James and the others if they think it'd be all right for me to go. He got direct orders from the Lord and he acted immediately. He did the same thing Paul did when the Macedonian vision came and he said, come over into Macedonia and help us. Have you ever wondered why it was that a man appeared and called to Paul and when he got there was a bunch of women praying? I guess those men were praying to get those women off our back. They're killing us with all this praying. Praise the Lord. But Paul didn't say, well, I have to send a runner over to Jerusalem to see if it's all right with the rest of the type of the apostles if I should go. Baloney. God never has worked his work that way. Friend, that's, that's not in the scriptures. When God deals directly with his people, he leads them to go. God's people need to be taught how to find God's will, how to try it against the word of God, how to discern the spirit, and then to do it no matter whether anybody understands it or not. The work of God is grinding to a halt because it's going through too many channels. We ought to get a lesson from our own government what happens when you send things through channels. I mean, it's just almost impossible to get anything done. People have to be free to do what God says. Now, in order to do that, they must be taught how to find the will of God. They must be taught the word of God so they'll know and not be deceived by the enemy. They're going to make mistakes. The people who make no mistakes are doing nothing. If a person makes a mistake, at least he's trying. If he learns from the mistake, it's not wasted. We need to learn what the Spirit is saying to us and through the Scripture, and we need to learn how to be obedient. And it's beautiful how God will work it out if we'll give him half a chance. Well, quickly, Acts 5, 20, uh, let's see, uh, Acts 17, I believe it is. 
Paul was on the ship, and it was being, he, he, he told the ship man, uh, the captain not to sail, it was bad, and he sailed anyway, and an angel came to Paul and told him, everybody be all, all right, just so long, as they sail on the ship. And he, t- he relayed that message on in Second Peter 1, 16 and 18. It talks about Peter, is, is re, um, he's remembering being on the Mount of Transfiguration when the voices from his excellent glory spoke down and they were in contact with the spirit world. Friends, in the days that are coming, we shall increasingly be in contact with the other world. This book will give us guidance. The Holy Spirit who indwells us will give us guidance. We must learn to distinguish. We don't learn this all at once. It'll be a gradual, growing process. But God wants to set his people free. And when the catastrophic judgments of God begin to fall, increasingly we shall have to depend on divine leadership. We will not have any human leadership to call on many times. That's true today even, isn't it? Now that doesn't mean doing your own thing and running wild and all that. All of the other things in the Bible fit neatly under God's program, but God's main program is to loose his people so they can walk under his leadership and be obedient to him. We'll find our true freedom in being submissive to the Lord. In being submissive to the Lord, we'll not... Will we achieve perfection? Yes, when they get our new body. Will we achieve perfection before that? It is very, very doubtful. Is it worthwhile to move in that direction? Definitely. God always encourages us to move in that direction. Amen? And so you and I need to be moving in the direction God is going. Find out where he's going and get on the train. Amen? And learn and walk with the Lord. If you're here this morning, you've never asked Jesus in your heart, would you like to? Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If you've never asked Jesus to come in your heart or you're not sure that you have, wouldn't you like to ask him this morning? You could pray something like this. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here and now to come into my heart and save me from all my sins. And if you haven't asked him before, he'll come in. If he has come in, he'll show you why you're confused. You say, supposing I do all that and nothing happens, I'm still confused. And make your way to the front, tell me or one of the workers, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. And take the word of God and help you to get grounded on the book that never will fail. That's God's word. And then you can know for sure. If you're being driven, you're being harassed, you're being tormented by things you can't control, compulsive things that get out of hand, by all means, I would encourage you to seek Deliverance from evil spirits. For Jesus said, These signs shall follow those who believe, and my name shall they cast out devils. He didn't give that power just to be giving it. He gave it because it was necessary to cleanse the church and purge her and get her on her feet and walking with the Lord. So if you think you have evil spirits, by all means seek help in deliverance. There are many workers here. I'm not the only one. I'm just one of the workers. And there are many workers here who can help you. And in our church, it's a body ministry, and there will be many workers as well as many who are needing help. So when the invitation begins, there will be a lot of people here. Don't let that throw you. Just come on down because there are also many workers, and somebody will begin to pray with you almost immediately and seek help for you. If they can't get it, they'll call somebody else in. So you're more likely to get help so you have a whole body moving than you are where you have two or three. And then the Bible also says one of the signs that follows believers is that they shall speak with new tongues. So we make no apology for this. And we would encourage you, if you are a believer and have not received this gift from the Lord, to seek it. To find out about it. And if you want it, you can receive it today. Praise the Lord. Jesus never gave a gift that wasn't necessary, wasn't blessed. And so we urge you to seek it. No matter what you've been taught in the past, I was taught like that too, but it was wrong. And thank God I found out. And you can find out too. And then another sign that follows believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So if you are in 
physical needs, by all means, seek help and healing. In Jesus' name, God's still in business just like he used to be. By all means, seek help today if you need it.